Hello everybody. Today I'm here with Steven Shorrock. Uh, fortunately, we are able to do this. The pandemic has a lot of bad stuff, but also good stuff as well, good opportunities. And we are taking this advantage of talking with the great minds in the world about safety too and all these issues that we've been discussing in our community. And then uh, we got the opportunity to talk with Steven. Steven, thank you for accepting the invitation for the Brazilian public that is the majority of the viewers over here. Could you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your background and why we are receiving you here? The, what makes sense a lot for us? Thank you. Thanks, Hugo. It's a great pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. It's, uh, it's great to be able to share any insights I can with uh, Brazilian uh, professionals. Um, so I'm a psychologist and human factors engineer by training, by background, and for um, 24 years or so, I've worked in primarily in um, high, um, high hazard industries and primarily transportation. Um, and for a long time, I've worked in air traffic management uh, within aviation. Uh, other than that, I've worked with in uh, railways, in uh, system safety and human factors, uh, also within other high hazard industries such as chemical processing um, and also um, healthcare to some degree and uh, border control, these kinds of, these kinds of industries. And I've, I've worked in a variety of um, contexts. So at the moment I work at Eurocontrol which is an intergovernmental organization supporting aviation in Europe. Um, I've also worked as a consultant and as a full-time academic researcher in the past. Um, so in a variety of roles in large teams, small teams, um, safety, research, um, and so on. So yeah, that's, that's my background, but um, more or less I'm a transdisciplinary practitioner now so i try to draw from uh, various different disciplines yes uh, thank you for the introduction steven uh, the first question every time i talk to a, a psychologist or something that deals with uh, why people take some decisions or why people make sense something makes sense for people at the moment uh, and the errors uh, comes to my mind every time so uh, what are the, the, the most updated information about uh, human error? And, and because we are always trying to, to blame somebody. I, I remember when I, was, uh, when I was living with my parents, I have a, a brother, a younger brother. And every time I pointed something that he missed or he did wrongly, he said, yes, but you also something. <laughs> you know, he never said, okay, I'm going to fix it. And I still mm. seeing this in the in the organizations. Is there an an explanation for those kind of behaviors? Is this just human nature? I think in 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 most of life that is human nature. It's it, um, we we react based on our emotions, you know. So we observe something and we have an internal reaction, which might be annoyance, irritation, uh, frustration, anger. Uh, and then we um, make a judgment such as you were wrong. And that judgment can often be self-defensive. So we don't, we don't want to be the one that's, that's wrong. Um, and then we react or intervene, you know, externally in the world. And uh, that, that's, a, that's a cycle from Edgar Schein called Schein's cycle. So that describes the basic human propensity to uh, blame people when things go wrong. Um, and of course we do make mistakes that's that of course we do you know we 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 make mistakes and from a psychological or cognitive point of view we forget things we don't see things we misinterpret things um you know and we make decisions that turn out to be wrong and so on um but that's quite different to how we often use the term in industry where we connect uh, a psychological error with which is judged with reference to our own expectations and intentions versus an error in the context of a, 
of a high hazard system where there should be multiple defenses and so on, you know, and then we attach the error to an outcome. So the error becomes a cause of an accident. Those are two different things, but the way with, that we often react to the error is the same. It's like we've transposed a reaction for a simple situation to a very, very complex situation. We've transposed the same reaction um, you know, with a kind of person-based blaming rather than looking at the system as a, as a, as a whole. Um, so, I mean, a good example would be if a person does not do something, then, well, there are various reasons for that. Number one, they could have decided not to do something. So they could have thought about it and decided not to intervene. Um, the second is that they uh, may have decided to do it, but then forgot to do it. So they forget. And another reason may be that there is no cue. There is no clear indication that they should do anything. Those are quite different explanations. Um, but still what we tend to do when, when we have this omission is then we might blame the person, you know. Um, but further back or further up or further out in the organization or in the system, whatever we're talking about, there's other omissions such as the omission of the organization to predict that this was likely to happen because we know that people will make mistakes. We, we don't tend to point to that omission. We tend to keep at the personal kind of um, the personal level. Yes, <laughs> well explained. Uh, and uh, talking about it's still about blame and, and error, they are closely linked uh, in, in our complex systems. Uh, how can we better respond or as a company, as an organization, when there is a, a self-blame, when a person makes a mistake, for example, and they blame themselves uh, as it was their fault or as the system was perfect and they were the one that, that missed something. Uh, do, we do, do we need to do something in these situations? So what's your, your ideas on, on this? To protect the, the employee and keep the, the mm -hmm. environment uh, healthy for, for people to continue to develop their, their work? Yeah, well, that can also be quite natural that we blame ourselves for the same reason as before, um, just as we might blame ourselves if we, you know, let's say, you know, you're doing some work around the house and you drop a hammer and it falls on your daughter's toes, you know, we, 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 we blame ourselves. Uh, similarly, if you do something in a chemical factory and there's some kind of um, explosion, we, we do the same. We, we transplant this reaction for a simple situation into a much more complicated or complex one. Even though, even though the reaction should be entirely different. I, I'd say the first thing you should do is just listen to people um, because what they're trying to do partly is they're trying to process their emotions. And so um, a first thing to do is to listen to them, to allow them to vent those emotions. And, um, uh, and then there could be some intervention in as much as um, there can be a discussion about all of the factors that, contributed to this whatever it was happening um, and also all of the factors that perhaps could have been there um, to prevent that particular action or omission from you know becoming something much worse um, but that's probably that's a secondary thing I think after support has been offered to the person because primarily this is about meeting their needs and I guess their initial need is to try to make sense of the situation themselves, try to make sense of their emotions, um, but not just to leave it there. You know, there's an intervention that's sort of educational in um, explaining, number one, why we make errors, why we make mistakes on a psychological level. And number two, why these mistakes sometimes ultimately, you know, I'm not gonna say result in, but ultimately lead to um, some kind of accident, you know, um, and there'd be many factors that contribute to that. So that's a, so this first of a kind of listening 
Um, and the second, a kind of, I guess, educational and supporting role. But both of those are about attending to the person's needs, you know, that, that actually they have a, a need in that situation. Um, as, as somebody who's actually been, you know, in many senses, just a, a completely, you know, innocent um, part of this situation, you know, in as much as they've been harmed as well by it. Unless, of course, they were intending to harm, but that's not an error in that case. You know, that's yes. a totally different situation. Yeah. Uh, what is your thoughts on, on what are your thoughts on uh, punishment for, for errors or mistakes uh, inside the organization, disciplinary actions? Do you think in, in what situation do you think they can value can they can be valuable? In what situation do you think it stops the learning process? Uh, do you think it should be avoided uh, every single time? Uh, talk, talk us a little bit about it. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, it depends what you're trying to do. So, if your purpose is to um, stop people from reporting, and if your purpose is is to uh, stop learning and to stop improvement then it makes a lot of sense to punish you know uh, but that's just about all that it achieves when we're talking about what we might call for want of a better word honest mistakes so if we're talking about where someone was reasonably doing their job and they did something that you know pretty much someone with their training or experience you know pretty much anyone could do given the very messy work situations that we work in, um, you know, then that, that's, it simply makes no sense logically to punish because it will have unintended consequences far worse than the ones that, that, you, that you imagine. Um, but if on the other hand, the, there is really, you know, deliberate destructive um, behavior um, an example might be um, bullying, for instance, but then we're not talking about errors anymore, you know, but, or it, it, it might be something like, um, you know, driving, flying, something like this whilst under the influence of alcohol, where there's quite a, ver there's, a there's a clear violation of norms also within the profession. Then, then of course, there's a case. You know, there's a case for some kind of justice in that in that sense, um, but that's different to where we have um, errors, mistakes, where somebody does something that where they really didn't expect the consequences, and they were they were just trying to do a good job. You know. Yes, uh, uh, talking about it, I, I was thinking about normal work, and most of the companies, at least the best one, they don't discipline their people for errors or deviations during the normal work. And I play chess uh, and I, I play in a decent level. And when I started, I just uh, analyzed my, my, my losses. You know, when I lost, I, I come back and, and evaluated the, the, the situation. Why did I lose? And, but then I realized that the best players in the world, they analyze every single, <laughs> you know, uh, game. And they were taking the opportunity to learn from every single situation because when you win, somebody made a mistake that allowed you to win. Because if nobody makes any mistakes in chess, it's a draw. Always. It's a <laughs> That's why when yeah. a computer is playing another computer, it's a draw every time. Mm. Uh, mm. But in our companies, when I when I started uh, working and learning from, from their organizational environment, I realized that in safety field, most of the companies just learn when they lost, you know. <laughs> they just evaluated, mm -hmm. the, 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 they, they just do what I did in the past. So what would be, I know you are a specialist in learning from normal work. What would be your, your uh, hints your, your, uh, for, for those companies that are doing this as I did in the past, learning just when something bad happens? How can they take mm -hmm. advantage of learning in their success as well mm. well i think we have to if we have to look at the whole curve of operations you know so if you think of a, a a bell curve or any kind of curve really normally we 
in safety related professions we we are akin to the psychiatry of medicine you know we we try to learn about safety from quite rare or unusual episodes of unsafety unsafe outcomes just where some limit has been breached um, those are not usually representative of the um the, of the behavior of the system as a whole um, and also they're often very often due to a combination of factors that may never be repeated and so you have to learn from them for various reasons for moral reasons and practically it's useful as well but if you restrict to that yourself to those rare occurrences then you're always going to be surprised by the next one um, so paying attention to everyday work means means learning from all operations um, and they don't have we're not talking here about just learning from what goes well we're just learning from what goes from what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis um, and that requires um, a number of methods really but um, very simply they can fall into a small number of categories and one is um, just listening to people about their work so talking and, and listening about normal everyday work now that requires a degree a good strong degree of trust that when people disclose what happens in everyday work that they won't be punished for that so that we might call psychological safety or trust um, so that's what I call workers disclosed. Um, and, and then there's, there's observation or workers observed also requires a lot of trust and a good relationship to be able to observe people in a very natural way. Um, so they're two basic social science methods, but just observing people at work and trying to understand, to be curious about, about the way that people work, the variety of ways in people work. Um, and, uh, and listening to people. Um, so we have workers observed and workers disclosed. And, th and then we have lots of measurements, of course, workers measured. So there's various different measures of work, which will also give you an indication of everyday work. Um, certainly on the flight deck, for instance, there's tons of information that tells you in about all phases of the flight. Um, so there's, there's, there's many different measures. Uh, in other contexts, there's not so much information, and so you've got to be careful with the measurements because they give you a very partial, fragmented view of work. Um, but there are lots of different ways uh, uh, that you can learn about ordinary work, and within each of those, there are lots of methods as well that you can that you can use to try to build an understanding of how things work on a day-to-day -day basis, especially how um, patterns of work form and what those patterns of work are and if you do enough observation enough discussion enough measurements you will start to see those patterns just as we see them in everyday life we see patterns all of the time um, patterns of interactions um, now knowing about those gives you some degree of predictability so that when accidents do happen then they're, they're perhaps not so surprising as when they simply as we say in English, come out of the blue. They, they, they just come out of no, they seem to come out of nowhere, but in fact, they've come out of somewhere. They've come out of uh, patterns of work, which are influenced by the structure of a system, you know, especially an organization, you know, the staffing, the procedures, the training, the equipment, the policies, and how all of these things interact to affect the pattern of work. Yes, uh, and you mentioned something really important. I was talking to the... the the first uh, pilot of uh, a big Brazilian airways. And he was mentioning there is a system that tracks all the flights and gives you a lot of information. And they were learning a lot from this, uh, but in most of the companies, it's not so clear. And I realized that uh, most of the safety professionals, they, they were educated on technical skills, uh, risk assessment and those kind of uh, skills that they need to be hired, but uh, once they are hired, they need to deal with uh, psychological skills that they never had any any education, formal education on it. So, uh, as a professional of the era, what would be your, your advice for those professionals? Where can they learn from this? Because every single person I talk about it, 
they say you need to talk to people, you need to know how to listen, you need to be open, you need to create psychological safety. But we are talking pretty much uh, uh, about professionals that doesn't have these uh, abilities, those skills developed in a in a good level to be able to do mm. this. So, mm. uh, what should That's be your right. on, on this these cases? I guess there's a couple of there's a few ways that you can you can uh, improve that situation and on a individual level on a personal level um, you can do some training in something like counselling skills which for me when I did that training many years ago was about the most useful safety training I ha ever had you know much of the rest of it is kind of knowledge and technical knowledge. And also skills, but ones that you can learn on on the job, um, and they differ quite a lot depending on the company that, that you that you work in. Um, how you do a risk assessment, for instance, might be quite different in company A and company B. Um, but something like a basic counselling skills course, especially uh, just a person-centred counselling approach, which was originally originally developed by Carl Rogers, but really any kind of basic counselling skills training, which doesn't, we're not necessarily, we're not talking here about a year or two necessarily of, of, of training, you know. Um, you don't even need to learn all of the different um, theories of, for instance, psychotherapy and so on, but basic counselling skills. Um, Nonviolent communication is, a, is, another, is another approach to use that can be useful. Um, there are a few a few approaches like that on a personal level um, where you can learn and practice listening skills, reflection skills, uh, paraphrasing skills, um, empathic reflection, and so on. Um, that's on a personal uh, level. On on a, on, a, on a team level or a company level, it, it may be just be that you, within your team, whatever the team is, if you're in a health and safety team or whatever team you're in, that you actually employ people that do have these skills. Um, these are skills that actually, I, I don't believe everyone is capable of really developing. Or at least some for some people, it's much, much harder than others. Um, and so in some cases, it may just be that you need people with the right skills who have spent more time, you know, developing them and are more capable of expressing them. Um, and so that, that, that's two, two ways, but certainly safety uh, management can be quite like engineering in that way. Um, that some of the social interpersonal skills are not perceived as being as important as they actually are, which in both in both contexts, in safety management and engineering, of course they are. Yes, perfect. It's gonna be well used by the my colleagues. Uh, Steven, uh, we are coming to the end. So I want to ask you uh, about your current work, what you've been uh, spending your time on lately. Uh, if you can share with us, just to be, for us to be aware. Mm. Uh, well, I do quite a few things. My work splits into a few categories. Um, one is um, teaching people and facilitating systems thinking and practice. Um, so I do quite a lot of that, obviously, online nowadays. So teaching people to be able better to think in systems, which is which is critical, not just to safety, but to all aspects of, uh, of, of activity in organisations and, uh, and outside of organisations, society more generally. Uh, so that's a, quite a passion of mine. Um, then there's human factors support more generally to a range of projects, technology introduction and so on. Um, that's a second. And then a third thing is safety culture um, facilitation and assessment. Now, I don't do much assessment and surveying anymore. I used to do a lot around Europe. Um, but um, teaching organisations how to do surveys and how to do workshops and facilitating that process is something I do. Uh, and to, one thing I've done to facilitate that is to develop something that, that's called safety culture discussion cards. Uh, these you can find on skybrary.aero. So skybrary, like a library, but with sky.aero, um, A-E-R-O. 
And on there, you can find, you can search for them. They're downloadable for free. They're kind of postcard size. I should have one with me, really. They're postcard size. And they're available in, at the moment, three languages, um, English, Spanish, and Dutch. And they'll soon be available in Portuguese as well. Um, but I know that Brazilian Portuguese is it may be different in its written form even, I don't know, but that, that will be online soon. You'll find those in the next few weeks. Uh, the final thing I do is I edit Hindsight magazine. So this is a Eurocontrol magazine on human and organizational factors in operations. Also, that can be downloaded by through Skybury. So I'll just look for Hindsight magazine Eurocontrol or Hindsight magazine Skybury. You'll find it. And the last issue was on learning from everyday work. And the next one is on the new reality of operations. And you'll find previous editions on goal conflicts and trade-offs, um, well-being, collaboration, workers imagined, workers done, and a range of other themes. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. When I was reading your, your profile on LinkedIn, I said, holy moly, that's a lot. <laughs> He should have 100 yeah. years. So congratulations. Yeah, well, I'm... Mochi. I'm, I'm I like to say that I'm older than I look, but I don't know if that. Me too. Sure, yeah. <laughs> <true. laughs> <laughs> well, we're both we're both going a bit white. Yeah, but, um, I'm 38, I, I, I also, man. <laughs> okay, well, I'm 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 older still. Um, I also write a blog called HumanisticSystems.com, where if you want to read a bit more about what I've talked about, you know, these proxies for human work, workers observed, workers imagined, workers prescribed, and so on, then you can read about that there. HumanisticSystems.com. I'll put the, the links in the in the post so you guys can find everything over here. Steven, if I don't miss anything, if you want to talk about something that I missed, please feel free. If not, thank you so much. We are facing tough times uh, all around the world mm -hmm. with this pandemic. And fortunately, we have people like you that like gives your, your time to help other, others to improve their Uh, organizational and, and personal skills. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And I wish you all the best and all the best to Brazil.